Hi, everyone saying hi in the chat. Um, so thank you everyone for being here, for coming back. If this is your first time here, thank you for joining us. So before we get started, we did want to let you all know that the webinar is being recorded. Um, and here are other information. If you would like to get the PowerPoint, you can go to this website, um, or if you would like a higher quality, you can dial, um, dial the number on the webinar invitation. And this webinar is in partnership with the California School Based Health Alliance. Um, and if you want to learn more information about the California School Based Health Alliance, you can check out their website, which is right here. All right, so um, my name is Jessica and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And my name's Ashley and my pronouns are also she, her, and hers. And we are both health educators at San Ysidro Health um, Team Clinic. Uh, so we, I know that there were some people that weren't here last time and there's some people that were. So we're, we're just gonna quickly um, talk about um, go over the intro that we did last time, but it'll be a little bit more, um, it won't be as in-depth as last time. So basically we work at a team clinic in San Diego, located in San Diego, California. Um, and I know there is people that are from San Diego, California in the, in the chat. And we offer services all the way from birth control, STI testing, pregnancy testing, counseling. We also teach in the schools, we basically do everything that has to do with sexual health. Um, like that, that's literally what we do all day, every day. Um, and, okay. So I have a question for you all. So some of you may already know this if you were here last time. Let's see if you remember. Do y'all think that California minors, which are people ages of under the age of 18, are allowed to receive sexual health services without parents' consent? Um, and if you're just joining in right now, we are using a um, website called menti.com. And you can see the code up on the top, which is 4346-3429. Um, it's also been shared in the chat. So all you have to do is open another tab or open it on your cell phone. Um, go to www.menti.com. All right, so most people are, um, we have two people, that, three people that said yes, two people that said no. Okay, so then let's move on to the next question. which is, are sexual health services free for California minors? All right, so you have 15 seconds. Five seconds. Time's up. Let's see what people answered. All right, so most people are saying yes. So there's a few people that said no and I don't, or they don't know. So the answer for both of them are yes. Youth can receive free and confidential services in California. How does that happen? So in California, we have a really cool insurance program called Family Pack, which basically um, allows people, um, people, most people that qualify for it um, to receive free um, sexual health services. And most youth actually do qualify. You sign up with it, you sign up for it with your information and your parent information is not needed at all. Um, and you can sign up for it regardless of your gender or immigration status. And where do you sign up for it? So um, you can sign up for it at any of your local family planning clinics. How do you find a local family planning clinic? We got you. So there's this really cool locator. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put this in the chat. You can type in your address or your zip code and you can find your closest family planning clinic and that should accept any type of family pack insurance. There's also, if this one doesn't work for your address for whatever reason, there's also another website called teensource.org, which we will also put in the chat. 
um, that can also help you look for a family planning clinic that's in your area. So I see there's a question in the chat. Um, what is your job title? So technically my job title is a program coordinator. Um, and then Ashley, did you wanna share yours? And I'm a health educator. So pretty much our realm um, of what we do is teaching health education in classrooms. We also work in the teen clinic. So if you ever want um, to get those reproductive services, whether it's like birth control, STIs, or even just a counseling session, me and JB both work in that office too. Yes, and if anybody's interested in like public health careers or like what we do, we're also open to talk about that. All right. And then just a few, um, just a few more um, information or just a, um, on like the intro. So minors ages 12 and up have the right to receive um, any sexual health services basically without their parents' consent in California. So this includes anything pregnancy related, um, sexual assault services, or sexually transmitted disease um, treatment and prevention. Minors 12 and under have the right to receive some of these services without their consent. Not all of these, but some of these. Um, and then also one more thing to know is California law allows minors in grades seven through 12 to leave school sc during school hours if they need to go to a confidential reproductive health service appointment. Um, by law, parents cannot be notified of this absence and school shall not be held liable. So if you have any questions on your rights, please let us know. Um, or any questions at all during the presentation, um, please feel free to write it in chat. We're open to having a discussion, to answering questions while we're talking. Um, we're also gonna have a lot of like interactive questions on the mentee. Um, so feel free to write in. Although one thing with the mentee, I would suggest if you write, if you wanna write like, I don't like, I think the word sex is, um, censored. So if you want to write the, the word sex, you might want to put like a little, like a little star just because it, it blocks the like, quote unquote, bad words or any, any words that are like maybe profanity. Um, so just be careful with how you write in the, um, in your answers or any questions that you have, because it might show up censored on our side and we might not know what you, what you meant. All right. So um, before we get started, um, for the people that weren't here on day one, so today we're going to go over birth control and STI. So that's mm -hmm. going to be on our agenda today. Last time we talked about anatomy. We're going to talk about it a little bit today, but today will mostly be birth control and STIs. So I'll let Ashley take it away. Yes. And then like JV was saying the questions, um, if you want like the private questions again to us, make sure it's just a panelist or at the very end, we have anonymous questions. So if you were here on day one, your name doesn't pop up and you can see all your questions. Everyone can see all the questions without seeing a name, but okay, let's get started. So if you were here last time, we did a little consent video. This time around, we have a nice little like acronym for you. And it's so easy to remember everyone can remember this acronym fries so who doesn't love fries i love fries and for consent we gotta love fries so just an easy way to think about consent to know that it's freely given so with when it comes to both partners consent is mutual you can say yes or no um, and there shouldn't be any type of pressure involved not any force or manipulation that wouldn't be freely given consent um, it's reversible so that means that if you said yes to one thing, you can always, always take it back. It doesn't mean that you said a yes to everything. Um, you really know that someone can change their mind at any time. So maybe if you really wanted fries and then you weren't craving it anymore, you don't have to wait in line and purchase the fries if you don't want them. Um, it's also informed. So both partners need to know exactly what they're consenting to every single time. If 
you are not getting your fries at McDonald's if they somehow snuck in like a chicken nugget when you didn't want a chicken nugget, when you only wanted fries, that would surprise you, right? Um, so obviously I'm not hungry today, but we'll keep going. Enthusiastic. So you should be excited to get your fries, right? You should be pumped for it, both of you. So both partners should have an enthusiastic yes. It should be mutual, consensual, all of that, but you should want to be excited for it. And um, this will make both parties feel comfortable overall when it comes to consent and having that conversation. And then of course, specific. So each individual affection um, requires consent each time. So like I said, just because you consent to one thing doesn't mean you consent to all the rest. And um, just to put a little realm on it, you cannot, if you're under any influence of like a substance, drug, maybe you're not in your right mind, you can't go get fries. How are you going to go and get fries? How are you going to give that consent? So just putting it in that realm as well is that you really, really have to be um, in your right mindset to fully give a enthusiastic, informed yes. So moving on, this will be the little refresher to anatomy. How does pregnancy occur? So get your little phone out. Um, if you have the tab open on your computer, how does pregnancy occur? So just left the question kind of general open. Want to see what answers we get. And it should pop up as little, you can write as long as, long as you need. Yeah, if, and if you can't, for whatever reason, reach the mentee, feel free to write it in the chat. Mm -hmm. So how does pregnancy occur? A sperm yes. meets an egg. I'm waiting to see if anyone else answers, yeah. just in case. A sperm and an egg meet in a woman's body. Yeah. I think y'all were paying attention last time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't want to take credit, but. <laughs> but I know. <laughs> Basically, I love this. A person with a vulva and a person with a penis have sex. Yes. One sperm fertilizes an egg and it develops into a baby for nine months. Oh my yes. goodness. That was even more than we went over. When a man's sperm goes into a woman's body, it meets an egg inside and the cells multiply and create a child. When a male sperm meets an egg in a woman's body. Okay, amazing. Sperm meets an egg. And I saw a lot of different types of answers. We can continue to the next slide. You all were so spot on. So yes. pregnancy does occur when a sperm meets an egg. You can't just say like, it happens when people have sex because as me and JB mentioned last last time, and as we're gonna mention today, lots of different types of sex. Um, there's even same sex sex, which means that a pregnancy isn't always a possibility. So specifically for this, it would be a person with a uterus and a person with a penis who can produce sperm. Um, that is when a pregnancy can occur. So a sperm meets an egg um, and they have sex with a person with a uterus, like I mentioned, but it is also when um, the egg is fertilized. So that means it would implant in the uterus and actually become a pregnancy. All right, so I know we've been talking about like the different types of sex. So I wanted to make sure that we're all clear um, about the types of intercourse. So um, vaginal intercourse is when a person with a vagina um, has sex with either someone with a penis, or it could also be with, uh, with a sex toy. Um, it could be any type of penetration um, that could be um, vaginal sex. Oral sex is when a, a mouth meets another genital. So um, a mouth meets a penis or a mouth meets a vulva. And then anal would be when um, an anus meets either a penis or a sex toy. Um, so those are the three types of intercourse. And like we said right now, and actually had previously said, only vaginal sex, um, when it is with another penis that can produce sperm, can um, produce a pregnancy, right? So what about the other ones? Um, 
do we think i mean and we don't have a a question up here but let, let me just see in the chat what do y'all think what do you think if a person were to have oral intercourse let's say a person with a vulva were to have oral intercourse with a person with a penis do you think that they would have any chance of pregnancy or anal and either of them do y'all think they would be any chance at all Okay, so we're getting some no, some yes. I, I hope, hope not. not. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it depends, right? Because technically speaking, like if a person was having oral intercourse, there is no way for the sperm to get to the uterus through the, through the throat. Mm -hmm. Or if a person was having anal intercourse, there's no way that the sperm can get to the uterus through the um, anus but sex like someone said in the um in the chat sexual fluids can travel and some something called gravity does exist so let's just say that a person is having anal intercourse and then the sperm just like ma not magically but because of gravity it goes down to the vulva and it goes into the vulva then that can cause a pregnancy so technically speaking anal intercourse doesn't cause a pregnancy but there is still that possibility there um same thing with oral intercourse um if a person were to have sex and then they have some time of some, some type of sperm um meet their vulva then there's still that chance there so there's still that chance there, but um, it's obviously not as high as having vaginal intercourse. All right, so now that we talked about the types of intercourse that um, may produce a pregnancy or the chances, um, how, how can pregnancy be prevented? What do we think? using protection or not having sex at all yep exactly condom anal a ring and of course no sex wear a condom using a condom anti-pregnancy pill yes i feel like you you guys you guys got this <laughs> no but i'm glad that um you all are so informed abortion condom yes So pregnancy can be prevented, um, which is basically what y'all said, using birth control or like you guys were saying, condoms, um, pills, all of that is birth control or not engaging in intercourse. And that's literally what you all said. So claps to y'all for knowing that. And so when we talk about birth control, um, we want to get a little specific and break it down into categories because I think birth control can be very, very overwhelming at times when you think about it. So break it down into those three categories of abstinence, hormonal methods, and barrier methods. So when we'll get into talking about abstinence, hormonal methods, exactly what it sounds like, they use hormones. So either they use estrogen and progestin or they use just progestin. And then barrier methods, if you almost think of like, what's a barrier do, like a wall or something, it blocks another, either a person from entering, it blocks something. So when you think of barrier methods, try to think of what blocks something from getting somewhere. So I'm hinting at what's to come. You probably already know because you all answered great answers in the chat. Um, and then just know that when it comes to birth control, there is not one best method for everyone. Every body is different and every person's body reacts differently to different birth controls. Some people are on birth control, not for sexual purposes. Sometimes it's for acne, maybe it's controlling periods, maybe your doctor prescribed it to you. There's a ton of different reasons why a person may be using birth control. So you don't ever want to assume it's because they're sexually active or not. And maybe they're just, maybe they're not even sexually active yet, but they want to protect themselves. And just know it, birth control is most effective 
when used consistently and correctly. So that means using it as it's prescribed to you as often as it says to take it. And then next little Mentimeter question. Let's see if you guys, you all get it. Let's see. What method of birth control is 100% effective in preventing pregnancy? The 100%. And I didn't go over percentages yet, but which is the one that's 100%? Mm. All right, all right, it is abstinence. So the reason why it's abstinence is the 100% the most effective. When we're talking about abstinence, we're talking about all the types of sex JB mentioned earlier. So oral, anal, and um, vaginal sex. So that means not having any of those. So, or genital to genital touching. So we're talking about 100% abstinence. It's the most effective way to prevent pregnancy and protect against HIV and STIs. So this option is available to everyone. Um, you can choose to be abstinent for different reasons at different times in your life. So don't think that you have to be abstinent before you're sexually active. Um, there really is no concept of when we talk about when you hear the term virginity, that really is a man made term. So when it comes to you and your own personal sexual journey, just know that it is completely up to you. Um, you're in charge if you want to be abstinent later on in life, you can. And whatever sex means to you, if that means um, oral sex, vaginal sex, anal sex, that's really your choice. Um, so just that, just know that this requires that partners communicate well and work closely together. And overall, um, this is what we're talking about when we talk about abstinence. So before we get into the other question, I did see that there was a question in the chat. Um, it says, if you're using birth control and stop taking it, could you get pregnant? Yes, the answer mm -hmm. is yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not going to happen the next day. You, um, yeah. we got to give our bodies like time to adjust itself, mm -hmm. to start ovulating again. Um, mm -hmm. so it might take, depending on everyone's body, like anywhere from two to like four to five months for the body to start regulating itself again and to get used to not, um, and I'm assuming you mean like hormonal birth control, um, to, yeah. to get used to not having hormonal birth control. But if somebody is using like condoms, like they can, you know, obviously get pregnant uh, if they stop using them at the next, um, the next time. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next question was this one mine actually? Yeah. Um, so what body part is this? We learned this yesterday, I think. So what body part is this middle one right here? The green one. Okay, time's up. Yes, it's the uterus. Um, so the little green one. Oh, let's see if I can get the picture back up. No, I don't think I can. I know, I think it's hard to get the picture back. Okay, well, the green one was the uterus. And then like, if you saw the little canal, like a little canal, that was the vagina. And then the ovaries were the ones that the little like circles that were at the end of the of the little arms, also called the fallopian tubes. Oh, here you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, the canal down here is the vagina and then the ovaries is this. And then this right here is the uterus, which is where a pregnancy occurs. So yesterday we talked about um, when a sperm meets an egg um, and it fertilizes, it becomes a zygote. So it will implant into this uterus right here. And then nine months later, um, when a person is ready to give birth, um, the cervix down here will dilate and then the baby um, will come out of the vagina. So that's pregnancy in literally like 10 seconds. Um, so how does um, hormonal birth control um, work and what does it actually do to the body? So basically hormonal birth control does three things. 
So the first thing that it does is that it thickens the cervical mucus. So if we remember the cervix is this really small, tiny, tiny part of the uterus. Um, and it's actually as big as the tip of like a pencil. It's really, really, really small. Um, this cervix, um, as I said previously, one of its main functions is to dilate when a person is ready to give birth. Another one of its functions is to produce mucus. Um, so usually when a person is ovulating, um, this, the cervix will produce mucus that is very um, thin and clear so that it can help the sperm move up to the uterus and all the way to the eggs. Um, but when it's trying to make it difficult for the sperm to get through, then hormonal birth control will try to make the, the cervical mucus really thick so that it's hard for the sperm to get through. So that's the first thing. The second thing hormonal birth control tries to do is stop ovulation overall. So if we remember from yesterday, um, a person with a uterus ovulates once a month. So what that means is an egg releases from the ovaries once a month. And as we know, an egg is the other half of, um, of like a zygote. So what produces a pregnancy, right? So it prevents any egg from releasing from the ovary. So if there's no egg, there's literally no, no chance of a pregnancy, right? Um, and then the last thing it does is it thins the lining of the uterus. Um, so if you see right here, the uterus is the one in the middle, but then you see these lines right here. So usually these lines will, when a person is not on birth control, they will produce blood and nutrients. Um, and this blood and nutrients is in order for the, in, for the egg, when it implants into the uterus, when there's a pregnancy, for it to implant into a healthy uterus and for it to be a safe environment. So whenever there's not a pregnancy, whenever there's not a, um, a fertilized egg implanted into the uterus, all of that blood and nutrients eventually leaves the body out of the vagina. What is that called? Can somebody answer that into the, in the chat? What is it called when there's blood coming out of the vagina? A period, yes. And that's how the body lets the person know that they're not pregnant, right? Because if, it, if, if there is a fertilized egg implanted into the uterus, the blood is gonna stay there to help the egg stay in a healthy environment. So all in all, what I was trying to say is when a person is on hormonal birth control, um, this blood will stop producing and it will be very thin. Why does that happen? Because if there's no blood, there's no nutrients, it's not a healthy or safe environment for an egg to implant, then there's not going to be, an, the egg will not implant into the uterus and there will be no pregnancy. Um, so those are the three things that it does. I know it's a lot of things, but it's, th those are the three main things that hormonal birth control tries to do. And we have different methods and basically they all do this, those same three things, but it's just different. Um, some of them may have different hormone levels or some of them may just be different. Uh, we have the pill, the patch, the ring, shot, IUD implant. Um, the great thing about hormonal birth control is that there is several different options. And if one doesn't work for you, you can try the next one. If that one doesn't work for you, you can try the next one. So there's a lot of different options to try and there's one to, there's bound to be one to, to work for you. So I'm not gonna go into specific detail on each one of them, um, but if you're really interested in learning about each one of them, I'd highly recommend you to make an appointment at your local family planning clinic so that a health educator or a doctor or a nurse can go over um, each method with you. Um, I think that would be the most helpful. All right, so next question is on Ashley, right? Yes. So which of the following hormonal methods can protect against STIs? Which one? And then I saw the question in the chat, so I can answer that too.
So trick question, none of them can protect against STIs. So the IUD, the implant and pills can protect against pregnancy. And I see people answering in the chat too, but none of them protect against STIs. So we'll be going over what does. But before I get into that, um, someone asked, is the implant permanent? So all the birth control methods we mentioned are not permanent. There are some that are long-term. So the implant would be considered long-term and an IUD would be considered long-term just for how long they can last in your body without you having to change it. So the implant is now five years. The IUDs, depending on the one you get, range from three to 12 years. And there actually is an IUD that isn't, um, that doesn't contain hormones and that's the copper IUD. But like we said, we won't get too into them because we can go really in depth and then take up all your time, but we won't do that unless you have questions. But if you don't like the implant, it is inserted in your arm, um, either left or right, and it can be taken out. We do recommend for any birth controls to stay at least three months in your body. So your body can adjust, you can get used to it and kind of figure out um, if you like or dislike the side effects it has on your body, if there are any. And so hormonal methods at the end of the day do not protect against STIs. They only protect against pregnancy. But what does protect against STIs is barrier methods. So the barrier methods I talked about, they block. And we'll be going into another little question for you. So which one is not a barrier method? So I didn't go over barrier methods, but take a wild guess, which one is not a barrier method? And sorry, if these are really fast, sometimes it gets overwhelming, the little Mentimeters. Yeah. So a dental dam, an internal condom, and a latex glove are barrier methods. Saran wrap, not so much. Saran wrap is probably to keep your food um, staying a-okay in the fridge, but um, a dental dam is actually great. You can, I don't have a any with me right now to show you all, but you can even use a condom, um, cut out a external condom, cut it down the middle, cut off the tip. And if you stretch it out, that would be a dental dam. And that's pretty much for oral sex. So you can use it for vaginal oral sex. Um, you can even use it for like anal oral sex, things like that. Internal condom, we'll be showing you that too. That can be inserted into anyone who has a vagina or anyone who has an anus. But if you use an internal condom for anal sex, take out the ring that comes with it and it's already pre lubricated pre-lubricated and of course there's a latex glove too so I just noticed that's so funny I'm seeing people answer in the chat so barrier methods are all the ones that we were mentioned except saran wrap but the main ones are internal condoms and external condoms so the reason why we only have internal and external condoms on here is because we're going to talk about the ones that protect against pregnancy Dental dams and latex, glove, latex gloves, those protect against STIs, but not necessarily pregnancy. And I know it's probably getting confusing, but I know Ashley was talking about internal condoms and about a ring. So I have one right here. Um, and this is an internal condom. It comes in this package. And again, it goes inside um, of either a vagina or an anus. And this is the ring that Ashley was talk talking about. You can take it out. Um, if it's going to be used for anal sex or leave it in if it's going to be used for vaginal intercourse and the way that it's like really lubed up so that's why it's so hard um, the way to put it on is basically just turn this little ring into a infinity sign and then you put it inside of the vagina and then all the way up and that's how it's supposed to look like on the outside and then when intercourse is starting, we just recommend pe people to hold it in place for a bit um, so that it doesn't like move to the side. Um, and yeah, so that is the internal condom. But before um, we get to like the external one or before someone tries to use any condom, what do we think the first step of using a condom is? Write it in the chat.
read the instructions. Yes. Oh my God. Now my laptop is all looped up. <laughs> so read the instructions, unwrapping it. Okay. These are great steps, but it's not the first step. If we have putting it on, great step. Yes, Angel and Valeria consent. If we had a prize, you would get it, but you are, everyone is um, able to enter the raffle. So you might win your, a gift card. Um, so yes, consent is a first step of putting on a condom, asking and receiving consent is a first step. Um, and then once a person gets an enthusiastic yes, um, the next step would be to check the expiration date. So believe it or not, all condoms have expiration dates. Um, and this one is right here. It says 2023. So we're good to go. Um, check for air bubble. So every condom should have a little bit of air in it. Um, just like a kind of like a chips bag that they all have air so that you can tell that if it's not if they're not stale it's the same thing with condoms if you notice that there's no air in it that means that there's probably a hole in there and it's not it's not good um, after you do those three things you open the condom wrapper make sure that you open it with your fingers and not like with your teeth or anything um, and then after that you will determine which one's the right side up. Because if we do it, um, if we put on a condom on the wrong side up, actually that was the wrong side up, um, it's not gonna roll all the way down. And then if it doesn't roll all the way down, most people's first instinct is just to flip it over and just do that. But we actually didn't talk about this yesterday, but there's a fluid called pre-ejaculatory fluid, also known as pre-cum, that may be at the tip of the penis. So if a person were to do that and just flip it over, now that fluid is on the outside of the condom and can potentially go inside of um, either a vagina or an anus or a mouth. Um, so the protection isn't there anymore, right? So we wanna make sure that it's on the right side up. We like to call it sombrero side up. It's supposed to look like that. You could also see it in the in the powerpoint so that's how it's supposed to look and i'm gonna take out my wooden penis model so trigger warning right now um and then once you put it on the tip of the penis um you it should be easy to roll all the way down um and then once um ejaculation has occurred we recommend for people to move away from the partner's body and then slowly remove it and then once you remove it, you can tie it, you can do whatever you want with it, but just make sure to throw it out in the trash and not flush it down any toilet because that's gonna clog up the toilet. All right, so that was a really quick condom demonstration for you all. Now we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, and is wearing two, do you think wearing condoms, uh, two condoms at once is safe, true or false? So whether that is wearing two external ones at the same time or one internal and one external, um, do y'all think it's safe? Ooh, so wearing two condoms at the same time is not safe. So it is false. So the reason why it's not safe is because if two of these start rubbing against each other for a long periods of time, they're gonna eventually break. So if they both break, then it's gonna be skin to skin contact and there's gonna be no protection there. So it is really not recommended to use two condoms at once or any more than two. We recommend only using one. One is always gonna be the best protection. So it's not like doubling up. Um, it, that doesn't work with condoms. Also reduce, reuse, recycle doesn't work with condoms either. Once one is used, it's one and done. Um, so throw away that one and start over with a new one for the next intercourse. All right, and then other methods that we didn't talk about are um, withdrawal or also, also known as the pullout method. Um, and this method, we don't really recommend it because it is, um, 
it's not as um, effective as the hormonal methods or the barrier methods because like I said before, there is a fluid called pre-ejaculatory fluid that comes out of the penis before ejaculation. So with withdrawal, a person would um, with withdraw from the body um, before ejaculation. But again, with that pre-ejaculatory fluid, um, it's always there, it's there before ejaculation. Sterilization, which is a permanent. So I know somebody was asking about permanent. Sterilization is the only permanent um, type of birth control, but usually um, young people aren't able to get sterilization. So we won't really get into sterilization. And then fertility awareness is basically keeping track of um, a menstrual cycle for a person with a uterus so that they're able to know when, um, when in, their, in the time of their month is the, the highest percentage or the highest um, chance of them to get pregnant and the lowest chance. We don't really recommend it for young people because most young people don't have um, a regular period. So fertility awareness um, is only recommended for people who constantly have like 30 day periods, like not 30 day periods, like a period every 30 days. Um, so it's for people who have a regular periods and most young people, their bodies are still regulating and it's totally normal to not have um, a period every like 30 days or 28 days when you're young. Um, and I know I'm kind of going fast because we're running out of time and we wanna make sure to get to STIs, but just a few things to remember is not everyone uses birth control to prevent pregnancy. Ashley talked about this before. Um, hormonal birth control may cause side effects. Um, anytime you put something into your body, um, that's foreign, it might cause side effects. So checking with your body, if there's a side effect that's affecting your life, it's okay to switch methods. Um, and different methods work for different bodies. So just because the pill worked for your cousin doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. Um, or just because it didn't work for your cousin won't mean that it won't work for you. All right, so let's get into STIs before time runs out. Yes. So just to point out, you'll see we say STIs, but you may have heard of STDs. So a lot of people still say sexually transmitted disease, but we really want to start saying sexually transmitted infection. Honestly, just because infection sounds less scary one, and it really isn't a disease because all STIs are treatable, but not all of them are curable. So when we talk about these sexually transmitted infections, there we're talking about inf infections that are passed from person to person through sexual contact. So this could be from different ways of the sexual contact. We'll get into how it's specifically spread from one person to another, but someone would need to have an STI in order to pass one on. So how common are they? Um, so common. So that is why we definitely don't want to stigmatize STIs or make anyone feel bad for having an STI. When we talk about STIs, we really want to make sure that majority of people that you know are most likely going to get an STI at some point in their life. So you really want to learn about it and get tested and not shy away from like hearing the word STI and getting scared. Um, so the age range for the most, um, the most like age range that get STIs is around 15 to 24 year olds, they account for half of all new STIs. So crazy, crazy little thing to know. But from that whole age range, which is a big gap from 15 to 24, um, you can be doing different things in your life. It's always, always good if you're sexually active to get tested. And half, like I was saying, of sexually active youth will contract an STI by the age of 25. So if you get one, not scary, but we're going to tell you about ways to prevent it, like condoms, like we just talked about. Um, and then just little, I guess, the statistics are about like chlamydia and gonorrhea and how they account for a lot of the new STIs and most specifically in San Diego County as well. So moving on, we'll talk about those different types of STIs and JB will be going into them a little more, but almost like the hormonal birth control methods, three different types that we break down into the, or into the categories of like hormonal, abstinence, barrier, STIs, same little thing, viral, bacterial, parasitic. So 
Viral is when I talked about that all STIs are treatable. Viral is actually a virus that cannot be cured. So, but it can be treated with medications or you can treat it to prevent certain, certain symptoms from occurring. When we talk about bacterial, antibiotics can completely cure a bacterial infection. So bacterial STI is curable and then parasitic STIs can be um, gone with just medicines, creams, and clear up any of those symptoms. So really good to know. Whoa, so getting into a little bit more of which STIs are which. Um, so bacterial, again, like Ashley said, is caused by bacteria and it is curable. That means that a person, if a person is diagnosed with a bacterial STI, they will just take antibiotics and they should be good to go after that. The um, STIs that fall under bacterial are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. So those are the three that are completely curable. And the next ones are the viral ones. So again, the viral are caused by a virus. They're not curable, uh, but they are treatable. That's the most important thing we want y'all to remember. Viral are not curable, curable, but they are treatable. And an easy way to remember all the viral ones is just think of the ones that start with an H. So HPV, which stands for human papillomavirus, HIV, which stands for human, human immunodeficiency virus, Hep B, hepatitis B, or herpes. Um, so I saw someone did ask in the comments, um, is AIDS a, um, an STI? So AIDS is not an STI, HIV is the viral STI. And then if HIV goes untreated, then it will turn into the syndrome, which is AIDS. So that's why it's so, so, so important to get tested. Um, and to treat HIV so that it doesn't get to the stage of AIDS because it's completely, AIDS is completely preventable. Just because someone has HIV doesn't mean that they're going to get um, um, AIDS. And then lastly, parasitic are caused by tiny parasites that live inside or outside of the body. Um, these are completely curable um, and Ones, the ones that fall into this category are trick or trichomoniasis um, and pubic lice. So back to the Mentimeter questions. Get your phone or browser ready. How are STIs transmitted? So, and you can select multiple. Wow, everyone got it right. Yes, so STIs are transmitted from skin to skin contact or bodily fluid exchange or body fluid exchange, but you cannot get an STI from sitting on a public toilet or just imagining you have an STI. <laughs> so a good little picture, skin to skin contact, but we're not really talking about like handshakes or things like that. When we talk about skin to skin contact, we're talking about like more sexual contact between like genitals, if you're um, doing oral, anal, vaginal sex, um, using like hands, um, things like that. Um, not so much, like I said, the handshake or public toilet that can get you an STI because that's not a sexually transmitted way to pass it to another person. And fluid to fluid. And fluid sounds very like general. So we'll talk about more of what fluid we're talking about. So if you know the fluid, go ahead and type it in. If you know one, if you know multiple, um, go ahead. There are multiple. So I will hint at that. Sorry, it goes so fast too. I know. So. I feel like it went by really fast. Yeah. Sperm. Okay. Yeah. So we had multiple correct answers, but... If you go to the next slide, we'll go over all the fluids. So these are all the fluids that can pretty much transmit STIs. It's like the, the star six, blood, semen. So even though you said sperm, we're talking more likely about semen because sperm are in the semen. Um, 
vaginal fluids, pre-ejaculatory fluid, like JB was mentioning, or pre-cum, anal fluids, and breast milk. So there are specific STIs too um, that are passed through these fluids, more likely to pass through these fluids, but these are all the ones to look out for. So really, really good to know these six, six different fluids. All right, so true or false, you can tell that someone or you has an STI by looking at their body. All right, yes, that is totally false. So um, next question is, what are some symptoms or signs of an STI? Yes, so all of these are symptoms of an STI, so which everyone you all picked, these are all symptoms or signs of an STI. Um, the last question is what is, even though those are all the symptoms, what is the most common STI symptom? Okay, the baby pain, cold sore. So, oh, I couldn't see all of them. Okay, yeah, I have no idea. Bleeding, urine, burning when urinating, cold sore. So these are all great symptoms, but the number one most common symptom is actually no symptoms. And that is why STIs, or one of the reasons why STIs are so, so common, because you we see so many times people don't know that they have an STI because if you're not showing any symptoms. You just assume that you don't have one, right? So you're not going to go get tested. You're not going to get treatment. And people are probably going to go and have sex with other people and unknowingly transmit it to other people. So that's why, again, it's so important. And we want to put so much emphasis on getting tested, even if you don't have any symptoms, because again, the most common symptom is no symptom. Okay, now it's officially like the last, last question. True or false, can you get COVID-19 from sex? Ooh, I know that's a, that's a tricky one. Or is it? Is it? No, just kidding. So true or false, it's actually true. So the only reason, well, not the only reason, but when you think about COVID, obviously the whole thing is, distance, staying apart, um, kind of not when it comes to like keeping a mask on, preventing if you cough, mucus, any particles. When you have sex with someone, you're most likely breaking that like six feet apart contact. Of course, when it comes to like vaccinations, things like that, things could change in the future when it comes to COVID-19 and sex, but it definitely is a possibility that being that in, in close proximity to someone who may have other people they've interacted with could give you a chance to contract COVID-19. But we know with research that co the COVID-19 virus isn't like sexually transmitted. So it's mm -hmm. not like through one of the fluids, but like Ashley said, because of that close contact mm -hmm. um, is what makes it possible. Yeah. And since JB earlier was saying no symptoms is the most common symptom, what if someone has an STI and they don't know it? This little slide is kind of showing you what could happen. So the first one is you can unknowingly pass it to someone else. That person can have one, not have any symptoms, have sex with different partners, and then keep passing it on. So creating that little web. Um, but if you leave it lingering, and you don't get tested to check, it can be causing harm um, or problems internally, even if there are no external symptoms. So kind of those medical concerns if it's left untreated. 
Um, and then having one STI puts people at a higher risk for contracting another STI um, if they come into contact with them. So that was something I learned when I got this job and I was like, whoa, I didn't know that. And then also it could cause fertility issues in the future. So you definitely, definitely, if you're sexually active, we do recommend to get tested every three to six months, depending on how like many new partners you have, things like that. But also just know if you had sex yesterday, your STI won't pop up today or it won't pop up even like two weeks from now. It takes a little while for an STI to actually show up in your body. So that's why waiting like the three months six months, um, you rather give it some time to really know if um, you have one or not. And then, like I said, reducing the risk of STIs, one of the ways is getting tested or getting vaccinated if one of the STIs does have a vaccination. Um, so either those three to six months, um, there's an HPV vaccine. There's a lot of different vaccines out there. So just knowing that you can get one to protect yourself. Abstinence, of course, is the only 100% effective way. And that's when we're talking about preventing against pregnancy and STIs. Communicating with your partner. So having that open kind of um, communication of being like, oh, have you gotten tested recently? Do you have any STIs? And I know it can sound awkward coming from like me telling you, but those are real things that happen. And it's almost nicer to know, um, have that conversation up front and really know if, you know, that if that communication is there, if you're already going to have sex with that person, might as well be comfortable with talking about what can happen after sex. You know, it's a part of the whole process. Um, so discuss boundaries, barrier method, barrier methods, and getting tested and the results. And then of course, using the barrier method. So actually using the pill, um, the patch ring, a birth control, and using a condom, that's the best little dual method you can possibly do. So you don't want to double up on condoms, but you do want to use whether it's a um, birth control method and a barrier method. So hormonal birth and barrier. You can really have a nice little, little mix with those two. So that finally concludes our presentation. We did get right to 530. Um, me and JB are available. We have the anonymous question slide, but this is like our little teen clinic services. Um, and then we also have a great sexual health advisory board. So obviously me and JB are like professionals, but we have youth kind of like promoting all the stuff we talked about to you all like listening in. So if you ever want to get actual content from youth who are doing these things at SB Shababy, and then teen clinic is our clinic we work at specifically. So at SYH teen clinic. And if you have time, definitely put in your anonymous questions. We'd love to hear from you. Also, you can put them in the chat too, if that's easier for you all. And you are all up for the raffle just from attending today. So you are eligible to possibly get a Target gift card. Um, and like Elizabeth said, it'll, they'll notify you as early as like next week. And don't forget to take that survey. Um, if you don't have any more questions or you gotta go, we understand. But thank you so much for all of you who attended and were here today. Yes, thank you everyone. Um, so we wanna end, make sure to end the webinar on time so that everyone can take the survey. Um, so we probably won't have time to answer your questions. We're so sorry about that. But again, please go to SYH Teen Clinic on Instagram and you can ask, you can DM us. Um, I know I might not be anonymous, but we keep everything confidential. We can answer your questions there or you can go to at SB Shababy and ask your questions there too. We want to make sure that everyone's question gets answered, but we also want to make sure that people take the survey too. All right, so thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure and fun to talk to you all about this stuff. And hopefully um, this can kind of inform you and educate you on things that you didn't know, or maybe it was like a refresher. But we hope that everyone has a good evening and see you all whenever we see you again. Bye.